friends, colleagues, esteemed guests. Welcome to this second of our bicentenary series of Gifford Lectures for 2022. My name is Paul Nimmo, and I hold the King's Chair of Systematic Theology in the Department of Divinity here. I'm also the Chair of the Gifford Lectures Committee. The Gifford Lectures are named after the prominent Scottish advocate and judge, Lord Adam Gifford, who died in 1887. In his will, he provided for a series of lectures to be delivered at the four ancient Scottish universities, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and St. Andrews. The lectures were to be with a view to promoting, advancing, teaching, and diffusing the study of natural theology in the widest sense of that term. Since 1888, the Gifford Lectures have become one of the most renowned public intellectual events in the humanities anywhere in the world. Here in Aberdeen alone, Gifford Lectures have been delivered by luminaries such as Alfred North Whitehead, Etienne Gilson, Karl Barth, Hannah Arendt, Richard Swinburne, Paul Tillich, Eleanor Stump, Sarah Coakley, and Mona Siddiqui. Our programme of 2022 lectures commemorates the bicentenary of the birth of Lord Gifford. And to continue our series this evening, we are honoured and delighted to add a further distinguished name to our roster of Aberdeen Gifford lecturers. Our speaker this evening is Robert Macaulay, the William Rand Keenan Jr., University Professor of Philosophy Emeritus and the founding director of the Centre for Mind, Brain and Culture at Emory University. A philosopher of cognitive science and a theoretical cognitive scientist of religion, he is the author or co-author of several significant volumes, including Hearing Voices and Other Matters of the Mind, what mental abnormalities can teach us about religions, and why religion is natural and science is not. He has published over a hundred papers in philosophy, religion, and the cognitive sciences. Professor Macaulay, we are thrilled that in your very busy schedule, you have made time for a first visit to Aberdeen in order to be here for this event. I now invite you to the podium to deliver your Gifford Lecture, entitled Religions and Their Cognitive Kin. Thank you. Uh, are we on? Is the mic on? Yes? Okay. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Nimmo, for that kind introduction. Um, I want to express my sincere gratitude to Professors Phil Ziegler uh, and Paul Nimmo, and uh, to his assistant, uh, Paula Duncan, uh, to the Gifford Lecture Committee, and to the University of Aberdeen for this invitation, and for their patience and persistence in bringing this event about after two years of COVID-induced delays. It's both an honor and a delight, finally, to be here among you and to have this opportunity to participate in this eminent tradition of Gifford Lectures, and especially to figure into the commemoration of the bicentennial of Lord Gifford's birth. This lecture, which should run a bit more than an hour, has four parts. In the introduction, I will discuss the recent confluence of evolutionary and cognitive theorizing about religions. Part two will take up maturationally natural cognition 
outlining two salient classes of cognitive tendencies or biases of the human mind that religions activate, namely the mind's content and context biases. These two classes of cognitive bias will organize everything else that I have to say that follows in parts three and four. Part three will address the contributions that each type of bias makes in shaping and perpetuating religions, particularly in large-scale societies. The mechanisms and processes are perfectly normal and perfectly natural. Consequently, religions have many cognitive kin. But in part four, I will scout two contemporary cultural developments that enlist these same cognitive biases in much the same ways that religions do, and that qualify, therefore, as religion's comparatively close cognitive kin. Now, to make things even simpler, the introduction addresses evolution, part two addresses cognition, part three addresses religions by focusing on content and context biases, and part four addresses religion's cognitive kin. So that said, let me turn to the introduction. Now in rethinking religion, Tom Lawson and I first proposed that understanding the mind's content biases pertaining to humans' representations of agents and actions in particular would provide insights about religious rituals. Subsequently, Pascal Boyer elaborated the evolutionary foundations of those and other content biases. Cognitive accounts of both sorts of biases, but about context biases especially, have figured centrally in more recent theorizing by Joe Henrich and other cultural selectionists concerning religion's cultural evolution. The interdigitation of these two complementary research programs has permeated the cognitive science of religions ever since. Now, evolutionary proposals about religions abound. All share a basic logic that Charles Darwin himself anticipated. They presume that evolution has produced adaptive cognitive and behavioral dispositions in humans. Whether such adaptive tendencies bear on religious matters directly or they are in place on the basis of completely different considerations and only pertain to religions incidentally, those dispositions have rendered humans susceptible to religious representations, to finding those representations appealing, and to developing commitments to them. Now, evolutionary theorizing comes in a variety of forms, depending upon the selective mechanisms and the levels or units of selection on which those theories concentrate. Recent theories range over three selective mechanisms operating, at least potentially, at three different levels. Now, theories about various features of religions occur in all nine cells in the resulting chart. However controversial, the notion of natural selection operating at the level of groups remains, and it does remain controversial. Now, as I indicated in the previous slide, I'm going to concentrate on what follows on two of these accounts, because they have proven the most influential in the cognitive science of religions. Now, when I press the button, <laughs> the next, um, everything under sexual selection will just disappear, okay? Um, I did want to acknowledge my colleagues, though. Um, that's not to suggest that these theories are either uninteresting or less valuable, but simply to indicate that they have so far been a bit less central and that time constraints, quite frankly, preclude their examination this evening. Okay, so here they go. <laughs> a further promising position which asserts that religiosity is a naturally selected adaptation, accentuates religi religiosity's many benefits and points to a growing body of evidence that religious involvement enhances participants' health. But that position is 
considerably less concerned with cognition. So, the first of the two positions on which I shall focus, namely the byproduct theory, also looks to natural selection. Byproduct theorists contend that religious representations take the forms that they do and that humans find those forms alluring because they are byproducts of cognitive dispositions for managing problems of survival. Byproduct theorists stress that from an evolutionary standpoint, these cognitive dispositions have nothing directly to do either with religion or with one another. Those dispositions deal instead with diverse challenges that humans, and particularly our ancestors, faced. And they are responsible for the many content biases which the byproduct theory spotlights. The second position of interest is cultural evolution. Over the past 40 years, numerous theorists have argued for cultural selection, which operates at all three organizational levels. Cultural group selection concerns types of intergroup competition, such as war, and differential rates of uh, reproduction, migration, or imitation. I mean, by imitation, I have in mind things here like cargo cults, where there's imitation of, in effect, Western arrangements in, uh, Microne in Melanesia. Sorry. Gene culture coevolution envisions selective interactions between genes and cultures as separate mechanisms of inheritance. Genetic changes can shape culture, and cultural arrangements can affect genes. The parade case for the latter is the evolution of lactase persistence over the past 4,000 years, which permits approximately a third of adults on the planet to extract nutrients from the milk that became available to various groups from domesticating mammals. The genetic influences on culture that the cultural selectionists headline have to do with the emergence of this evolutionary synergy in the first place. We, unlike other primates, acquired cognitive capacities that enabled our ancestors not just to produce culture, of which some other species have some primordial capabilities, but to learn it, to teach it, and to build on it as well. Now, our cognitive machinery for learning culture is responsible for context biases, which the cultural selectionists submit play a significant role in religious commitments. Now, note, it's perfectly possible for the proposals in all nine cells of this chart not only to be consistent with one another, but to all be true. Uh, though that's not the same thing as saying that they are all true, <laughs> okay? Um, each could explain, for example, different features of religions. The byproduct and cultural selectionist theories are not just consistent with one another, they are complementary theories, in that they account for different features of religions. And they both subscribe, and this is a crucial point, they both subscribe to the same conception of how the mind works. So, turning now to part two of the talk on cognition, I'm going to concentrate on cognitive arrangements that both of these two theories invoke. Now, for 40 years, cognitive scientists have advanced dual processing theories differentiating fast, implicit, or intuitive cognition from slow, explicit, reflective cognition. The Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman calls these System 1 and System 2, or if you're familiar with his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. System 1 involves implicit cognitive processing in mostly unconscious perception, intuition, and action. It's not just seeing or knowing that someone is frightened, for example. It's also intuitive know-how, knowing how to respond, for example, in the presence of an environmental contaminant. By contrast, System 2's explicit processing is implicated in deliberate perception, such as ear training in music, or learning how to look through a microscope, 
in conscious reflection when we think about you know, how to word an important email, and in considered action, such as learning a new dance. Now, contrasting constellations of properties are associated with each system. System two tracks our common sense understanding of thinking. As conscious and deliberate, we pursue such thought as we choose. Slow, explicit cognition requires mental effort and concentration. Think of children learning, you know, in first grade, learning how to read. System two System two talks. We often talk to ourselves when system two is engaged, though usually subvocally. Since it is mentally taxing, it involves, at least, at least metaphorically, pausing and taking a step back to reflect. Consequently, cognitive scientists describe this as offline cognitive processing. System one's intuitive cognition is mostly foreign to our common sense understanding of our minds. Intuitive online perception, cognition, and action are not just unconscious and automatic. They are mandatory. We can't stop them. Such mandatory intuitive perceptions, beliefs, and actions come so easily and so instantaneously that we quite literally don't even notice them from the perceptual recognition of human faces to the cognitive discrimination of syntactic distinctions to automatic action responses to environmental contaminations, contaminants, excuse me. As Kahneman says, this is a quote from Kahneman, we can be blind to the obvious and we are also blind to our blindness, end quote. Our automatic inferences are woefully, woefully underdetermined by the available evidence, yet we feel confident about their soundness. Now, in what follows, I shall examine System 1 operations. But distinguishing between Systems 1 and System 2 is not enough. For System 1's intuitive cognition can come from either of two sources. The more familiar is when we develop intuitive knowledge based on extensive exposure or practice in some area. Our understanding acquires what I've called at least a practiced naturalness. Practiced naturalness yields judgments that become automatic. Tasks, whether physical or intellectual, become easier once we've done them hundreds of times. Expertise allegedly comes from 10,000 hours of experience. Uh, chess masters, for example, immediately recognize thousands of different configurations of pieces and know effective responses to each of them. I mean, it's intuitive, intuitive for them. But expertise doesn't have to be anything that's rare or esoteric. Millions of people around the world are experts with their local systems of public transportation. And literate adults, which I assume includes everybody in this room, have acquired a practice naturalness with reading and writing. Literacy for these people shifts over time from a slow, laborious exercise involving explicit cognition to easy, fast, automatic, mandatory operations. What I mean by mandatory operations is, for example, an experienced English reader cannot look at the color patches on the screen right now without instantly and automatically reading them as English words. The English idiom describing practice naturalness is something becoming second nature. By contrast, some cognitive systems constitute our first nature. They possess a developmental or maturational naturalness, as some capacities emerge across human development without any obvious or direct preparation. It is such maturationally natural systems on which I shall be focusing for the rest of this lecture. For they are the fountainheads of both the content and the context biases on which the cognitive scientists of religion have built their proposals.
Arguments about the origins of maturationally natural cognitive systems, about what Cecilia Hayes calls the human starter kit, have raged for centuries. But crucially, such systems are readily characterizable independently of any stance on their origins. First, most maturationally natural systems are in place by school age. Some, including fear of snakes and the avoiding, avoiding the ingestion of contaminants, seem to require no more than a single exposure to a relevant stimulus. Human minds are poised to learn such things. Maturationally natural systems are operating before we recognize that they are. People recall when they learn to read and to ride a bicycle, but they do not recollect when they learn to talk or to walk. Maturationally natural cognitive systems deal with fundamental problems in a natural war world of predators and prey, and in a social world of competition for resources and mates, and cooperation in hunting, gathering, food sharing, and defense. <clears throat> If infants require instruction or remediation in such matters, they have diverged from what is regarded as normal development. <clears throat> now, much delay beyond the standard developmental schedule for those capacities will lead to consultations with physicians by parents. <clears throat> the emergence of these capacities does not depend upon any culturally distinctive assistance. Maturationally natural capacities emergence does not turn on instruction or schooling or on artifacts or on specially prepared environments. Children do not need to be taught how to chew or how to walk or how to recognize individuals or how to talk. The satisfaction of but a few diagnostic cues, this is going to be a critical point, the satisfaction of but a few diagnostic cues triggers these systems' operations. They deal with challenges that require rapid responses, which don't allow time for system two to sort of, you know, gather and weigh the evidence. In this regard, maturationally natural systems are fairly described as unintelligent. Stupidity here is the price for having automatic responses to perennial problems in a flash. Now this limitation renders these systems susceptible to persisting illusions. The point is not that we experience illusions, that's not the point, but rather that no matter what we know, we cannot help ourselves from experiencing some of these illusions. This includes cognitive illusions. For example, the law of small numbers is the automatic but incorrect assumption, that is, the persisting cognitive illusion, that small samples are just as representative as large samples. So knowing, for example, that small rural counties in the United States have the lowest rates of kidney cancer can lead us to not search out the fact that a comparable number of other small rural counties in the United States, in fact, have the highest rates of kidney cancer. Such illusions persist because once cued, the operations of the underlying systems are mandatory. The mueller liar illusion, famous illusion, provides a striking perceptual example. Even when we know that the two lines in the mueller liar illusion are the same length. Nothing that we can do or that we can think can make them look the same length once the arrowheads are restored. Cultural stimuli, like the mueller liar, incorporate cues that activate maturationally natural systems <clears throat> and thereby uncover their tendencies or their biases. Such cultural stimuli reveal what Dan Sperber calls these systems' susceptibilities. That is, their side effects when operating in environments that differ from the ones in which they evolved. Such susceptibilities to culturally induced side effects are what endow the byproduct theory's appeals to content biases. 
So, now turning to the first section of part three. Explicating the cognitive byproduct theory will furnish a partial inventory of prominent domains that elicit maturationally natural processing, as well as their accompanying content biases. And it will trace how religious representations mobilize these cognitive mechanisms. The byproduct theory aims to explain two characteristics of religious representations. First, that religions share no universal defining properties is a truism in contemporary religious studies. Still, the byproduct theory does account for why, across religions, some kinds of representations, superhuman agents, sacred objects and spaces, rituals, icons, myths, and more, recur so frequently. Second, the byproduct theory maintains that the feelings of familiarity and the cognitive ease associated with maturationally natural systems are the wellsprings of religious representation's attractions. Daniel Kahneman again stresses that, and this is again, again a quote from Kahneman, cognitive ease is associated with good feelings, end quote. We are at ease in dealing with these domains because abundant intuitive inferences come to us effortlessly. The byproduct theory holds that this cognitive effortlessness associated with some cultural representations functions as, in effect as a selection force that steers religions toward mimicking cues that provoke maturationally natural systems operations. The probability that some religious representation will persist increases just to the extent that it does just that. With this in mind, let me turn to examining some relevant domains and sketching how religious representations interact with their associated cognitive machinery. Language is a paradigmatic example of a maturationally natural system. Without instruction, young children become passable speakers in just a few years. That they proceed to generate innumerable novel utterances suggests that this is not the result of practice naturalness. Children also quickly gain an implicit command of their language's phonological, syntactic, semantic, and pragmatic patterns and develop sensitivities to and intuitions about variations of acceptable form. Uh, Noam Chomsky gave us you know, the famous example, curious green ideas sleep furiously. That's an ill-formed sentence, but it's different from the ill-formed sentence, sleep green, curious, furiously ideas. Those are two utterances, right? We've got intuitions that instantly come to mind about the fact that they're problematic, and we even have some intuitions about sort of what the difference is and the problems in each case. Intuitive recognition of these ill-formed locutions displays all of the characteristics of system one cognition. Native speakers not only have such intu intuitions instantaneously, they cannot suppress them. They are thoroughly confident about the soundness of such intuitive judgments. Yet few can even begin to formulate the principles that might inform those judgments. They also exemplify all the properties of maturationally natural versions of system one cognition, which is to say that they are also in place early, definitive of normal development, untaught, and engaged by distinctive cues. That religious people talk about religious topics is no surprise, but that is not the point. The question is, how do religions draw upon humans' linguistic sensitivities as a maturationally natural cognitive system? That happens because some religious representations have evolved to incorporate cues in response to which, in this case, Linguistic processing is mandatory and automatic. No matter how hard native speakers try, they cannot hear spoken utterances in their language as they hear other sounds in their environment. 
As Jerry Fodor argued, this is a quote from Fodor, not only must you hear an utterance of a sentence as such, but to a first approximation, you can hear it only that way. Now this is one of Giotto's depictions of Pentecost, which portrays when according to the book of Acts, Jesus' apostles, quote, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, end quote. Glossolalia, or speaking in tongues, is not confined to Christianity. It's not the only religion that has it, okay? Its recurrence across different religions in different eras points to a fact, to a fact that's akin to Fodor's assertion. Namely, that humans not only must hear utterances that mimic enough properties of speech as speech, but to a first approximation, they can only hear them that way. Glossolalia exploits humans' inability to hear as anything other than the use of natural language, others' articulations of not obviously repetitive sounds within a framework of language-like rhythmic structures and sonic inflections. Such utterances captivate because they incite mandatory linguistic processing. And that cues a whole host of default inferences to the effect that these utterances are spoken language, ergo they must be meaningful, ergo they must be interpretable or translatable, ergo it would be really great if I could find out what they mean, right? Now, not every religion has morally interested gods, but the connection of morality with big god religions is a standard presumption. Still, recent research in moral, comparative, and developmental psychology points to the naturalness of humans' non-reflective moral sentiments. Jonathan Haidt's research in moral psychology reveals that humans have similar intuitions across cultures about issues of harm and care, and about fairness and reciprocity, at least. From comparative psychology, my Emory colleague Franz Duvall supplies observational and experimental evidence about other primates to defend his claims for the primacy of our moral sentiments, for their natural foundations, and for their phylogenetic continuities. Now, considerable experimental research in developmental psychology squares with Duvall's conjectures. Six-month-old infants prefer agents who have produced pro-social behaviors, and three-month-old infants signal the same in preferential looking tasks. Young children exhibit detailed moral intuitions, for example, about what counts as a fair distribution of the candy. Yet not even most adults have any idea about where such intuitions come from. That is true about almost virtually all of these intuitions associated with maturationally natural uh, systems. Uh, it's not just our moral ones. Now, Boyer maintains that our cluelessness about moral intuitions' origins creates an opening for the gods stating that, quote, our evolution as a species of cooperators is sufficient to explain the actual psychology of moral reasoning. This requires no special concept of religious agent. Religious concepts are parasitic upon moral intuitions. Our moral intuitions become readily comprehensible when represented as the God's pronouncements and preferences as... In the Sistine Chapel, Cosimo Rosselli's depiction of Moses receiving, presenting, and then dashing the tablets containing God's laws. A divine command conception of pan-human moral sensitivities neatly solves the problem of explaining those sensitivities' origins and the problems of explaining their moral and psychological force. Now, religions routinely conscript our sensitivities about environmental hazards, including such things as dangerous animals and contact with contaminants. As with language, culture tunes contamination sensitivities, clarifying which substances qualify. That is to say, different things in different cultures constitute contaminants. 
just like in different cultures, different languages are spoken. Babies learn different languages. Behind such cultural variability, however, as Paul Rosen pointed out, are uniform principles. First, contaminants need not be visible. Second, any contact can transmit the peril that the contaminant harbors. Third, one touch is enough to contaminate fully. And fourth, once something is contaminated, decontaminating it will require special efforts. I've, I've joked around sometimes and said that as a child, this in the world I grew up in was called cooties. Historical evidence for these sensitivities predates the germ theory of disease by thousands of years. <clears throat> so equipped, humans are well prepared to perceive, understand, and interact with sacred spaces and objects, which trigger our system for managing potential contaminants whether by notably traversing circuitous paths around some spaces or by pointedly marking them off, or by conspicuous care in the handling of objects. Their exaggerated treatment intimates their safe handling only by the religiously authorized. Now note, religions invert the orientation of the contamination. The concern is with the threat that the participant poses to the sacred object not the other way around. Where are the contaminants, okay? If they can even approach such objects, participants often must be ritually prepared. Now, flipping the associated intuitions 180 degrees, however, does not hinder participants' abilities to readily draw the inferences about how to conduct themselves in such, such situations. Hazard precautions also extend to dangerous animals. Humans are not the only species that show wariness of snakes. Young rhesus monkeys acquire this phobia from a single opportunity to observe another rhesus monkey's fear of a snake. Based on one trial, and one trial learning is what we're talking about here, its naturalness is not a practiced naturalness. Religious myths across cultures regularly accord snakes prominent roles. They also often figure in rituals. Now, although Mark 16, 18 reports Jesus saying that, quote, in my name they shall take up serpents, end quote, very few Christians across the centuries have actually risen to that challenge. Still, America, at least, is home to more than 125 poisonous snake handling congregations. Just like Glossolalia, though, snake handling is not confined to Christianity. It arises in religions around the world. Now, snake handlers everywhere grab attention, stick in memory, and generate inferences about their noteworthy status a topic to which I shall return when I take up context biases. Snake handling turns out to involve both content and context biases, okay? Now, perhaps the most compelling evidence for a content-specific cognitive capacity is an inborn selective deficit for that capacity. Developmental prosopagnosics are otherwise normal people who are unable to distinguish individual's faces. Prosopagnosia suggests first that for most of us, a system committed to human face recognition just hums quietly along in the mental background. And second, that in some cases, that system can either be disconnected or fail to develop. Now, religions the world over employ paintings, icons, statues, miniatures, and more, portraying the faces of agents that activate that system. Ample experimental evidence, however, shows that uh, that pairs of eye-like stimuli are quite enough to induce participants to unconsciously manifest more prosocial behavior. As Aranoran Zion argues in his book, Big Gods, watched people are nice people. 
Theory of mind is a collection of accomplishments informing our folk psychology. The first accomplishment, namely distinguishing agents from everything else, we again share with many species. Detecting animate motion is enough. Philippe Rochat's findings showing that three-month-olds discriminate between non-human stimuli, these are just squares and triangles moving around on a computer screen, okay, that appear to move randomly, squares and triangles that move randomly, they distinguish between those versus otherwise identical stimuli, squares and triangles moving around on another screen, whose motions appear to be goal-driven. Homo sapiens and apes have a command of a second, more sophisticated collection of theory of mind accomplishments. They possess abilities to recognize, interpret, and predict agents' mental states, enabling them to anticipate those agents' actions and to navigate in a complex social world. Facility with theory of mind drives our penchant for psychological anthropomorphism. Everybody knows about physical anthropomorphism. I'm talking about psychological anthropomorphism, which disposes us to see a world suffused with agency. Humans are poised to detect agents and draw inferences about their mental states, no matter how circumstantial the evidence. So we regularly talk to our computers and our cars and find such agentive attributions reassuring, creating a thoroughly unjustified sense of familiarity, understanding, and control. <clears throat> now, religious talk about agents who possess counterintuitive properties triggers theory of mind. Those counterintuitive properties aside, religious agents are otherwise perfectly normal agents enabling even children to reason about them unhesitatingly. Mythic narratives mobilize theory of mind, readying, readying assumptions about mindful agents and their actions, and purchasing those narratives' plausibility, coherence, and memorability. By enlisting theory of mind, stories persuade us that when you actually think about stories and the series of events that, present, that are presented, the, the highly improbable series of events that they portray is instead inevitable. This is yet another persisting cognitive illusion that Massimo Piatelli Palmarini has dubbed the Othello effect. <clears throat> now let me turn now from our maturationally natural mental proclivities um, uh, that endow content biases, to the second part of section three of the talk, part three of the talk, concerning cultural selectionists' appeals to maturationally natural context biases that explain why humans develop commitments to particular religions. Mm. Archaeologists' discoveries of stone tools that predate the evolution of Homo sapiens by two million years and primato primatologists' findings that chimpanzees use and make tools both point to our phylogenetic heritage of cultural production and of social learning. Okay, and this term matters, social learning. That is to say, learning that others influence. Both our prehistoric cousins and chimpanzees have produced culture and learned socially. But those two things are not enough to explain our abilities to learn and teach culture, or our continuing explosion of cultural products, or our species' relative success, proliferation, and spread around the planet. Cultural selectionists hold that our species' secrets depended more on, sorry, depended on natural selection for cognitive mechanisms underlying a more sophisticated form, a more sophisticated type of social learning, which Joe Henrik calls cultural learning. That is, social learning, remember, social learning was about uh, learning that others influence. Cultural learning is social learning in which individuals seek to acquire information from others which in tandem with theory of mind very soon is accompanied by teaching, where model individuals actively transmit information to learners. 
Now, cultural selectionists propose that natural selection promoted cognitive mechanisms that enabled our ancestors to obtain adaptive cultural information from others more efficiently than more costly alternatives, such as individual learning. That's to say where everybody just has to figure everything out on their own. Generally, the more adaptive cultural items there are, honed and accumulated over generations, the more advantageous cultural learning capacities are. Cultural learning mechanisms, context biases, confer increasing benefits in ever more complex cultural settings by determining whom, what, and when to imitate. Okay, yeah. The evolution of cultural learning and teaching in a population leads to more and to more sophisticated cultural products, both material technologies and non-material practices, techniques, ritual, and knowledge. Each new adaptive achievement that a group can sustain and transmit to the next generation constitutes a new platform from which to innovate subsequently. Mike Tomasello calls this the ratchet effect, which results in a progressively improved fit of the cultural repertoire to the local environment. Now, such circumstances, under such circumstances, this self-perpetuating process constitutes a new selection force impinging on genes, individuals, and groups in what is proven to be an ongoing process of cumulative cultural evolution. Selection is for psychological dispositions to procure the many fitness-enhancing items available in the cultural environment and in other people's minds. Consequently, humans have come to rely on cultural learning and teaching for substantial segments of their behavioral repertoires. Now let me situate the psychological mechanisms in question. First, these context-biased mechanisms are part of System 1 cognition. Hence, their operations, to repeat, are unconscious, automatic, mandatory, fast, easy, and mostly unarticulated. Second, their operations are maturationally natural. Thus, they appear early, address vital problems, contribute to normal development, do not depend upon culturally distinctive support, engage when prompted by distinctive cues, and are thus susceptible to persisting illusions. That'll become important in the last part of the talk. As noted, human, humans' context biases are vital for cultural learning. So that said, let me uh, reposition this portion of the figure. Um, sorry. Uh, in order uh, to discuss context biases in more detail. First, the old adage, monkey see, monkey do, is dead wrong. It is we who are the slavishly imitative species. In numerous experiments, it is neither monkeys nor chimpanzees, but instead humans who dutifully imitate models without understanding the point of those models' behaviors. Psychologists have dubbed this, quote, over-imitation. That's their technical term. We are over-imitators. Innovations by individual chimpanzees have often been observed in the wild, but none of those innovations have persisted because it is we, and not apes, who ape. Second, context biases do not converge on behaviors that might be imitated but instead on the characteristics of models to be imitated. Model-based biases answer the question, whom should I imitate? Now, broadly speaking, natural selection would favor attentiveness to any cues that zero in on people who possess skills that are adaptive and learnable. So the first model-based bias is a disposition to imitate the successful. Learners who evaluate possible models to be imitated in terms of their relative competence and worthwhile skills 
and then imitate the most successful will be more likely to acquire adaptive behaviors, especially when the necessary skills are numerous and varied or when such skills are difficult to procure by individual learning. Now, one problem, though, is ascertaining which of a model's traits are responsible for his or her success. Both formal and a host of empirical evidence suggests that the adaptive solution is indiscriminate copying. That is to say, erring on the side of excess when copying the traits of the successful. A second problem, especially in very large groups, concerns the, difficulty associ the difficulties associated with judging others' relative success. One solution to that problem is to mind who has prestige. For many endeavors, highly skilled individuals are in short supply. That establishes a selection pressure on cultural learners to connect with such adepts, which learners typically do by aiding and deferring to them, to experts, and becoming, in effect, members of their entourage. Now, short of entourages, prestigious persons are disproportionately, there's lots of experimental evidence for this, disproportionately targets of others' visual attention and of their deference in conversations. Learners mimic prestigious person, persons' speech, style, and behaviors. People exhibit enhanced memory for the statements of individuals whom experimenters have arbitrarily designated as prestigious. If I break from this, this lecture is going to go long, but I'm going to tell you about this design. The design is uh, one where people are brought in, they're all given a little test of trivia. At the end, uh, you know, allegedly their tests are graded, and the experimenters announce that uh, John, Mary, and Sally are the three who've really done well on this test. In fact, they've just picked people arbitrarily. Okay? Um, but what happens is, is that, as I'll now tell you, um, um, people exhibit enhanced memory for the statements of individuals whom experimenters have arbitrarily designated as prestigious. And those arbitrarily marked individuals are both significantly more likely to cooperate and to be cooperated with in subsequent 18-round prisoner dilemma games. Preschoolers are four times more likely to consume foods and beverages that an apparently prestigious model has selected, and 13 times more likely to play with a toy which that model has chosen. The maturationally natural heur heuristic is locate and imitate the prestigious. But that's not always easy. When possible models are plentiful, model-based biases may have limited effectiveness, since the critical information for utilizing them is difficult to obtain. Such conditions have produced selection pressures for a second suite of context biases, namely frequency-dependent biases. When information about success is unclear or information about prestige is ambiguous, a compensatory strategy is simply copy what most people believe and do. Conformity provides, in effect, a good guess about what's adaptive when you don't know much. This is why it peaks during adolescence. <laughs> of course, if everyone relied exclusively on conformity, neither much cultural variation nor much cultural evolution would occur. But formal modeling suggests that when conformity bias is accompanied as it is by all of these other culture learning biases, and I'm not, this is not a com comprehensive list, conformity bias often proves the most effective strategy in informationally challenging environments. Now, the flip side of the conformity bias is a bias to attend to rare beliefs and behaviors. It, however, alerts the cultural learner about models who should probably not be imitated. A further problem associated with model-based bias favoring prestige concerns the possibility of deception. To benefit themselves or to handicap potential competitors, the prestigious might say one thing when they in fact think or do something else. Cultural selectionists have assembled 
a lot of evidence across cultures and in laboratories. For example, from the development of food preferences among children, that cultural learners have an additional model-based cognitive bias for protecting themselves from such manipulation. That bias accords special attention to what Henrik has dubbed credibility-enhancing displays, or creds. Creds are behaviors that signal models' commitments to their public protestations. They are actions that models take which they would find costly if they subscribed to different beliefs than those they openly advocate. Biased attention to creds helps to safeguard cultural learners from deception. Now, the byproduct theories focus on content biases. Uh, yeah, okay. Provides explanations for the forms, the appeal, and the recurrence of many religious representations across, across religions and across history. But it does not explain why people become so devoted to only some of these ideas. Okay, so the theory I talked about first has got a problem. It, there's some things it doesn't do, okay? Moreover, about such devotion, uh, sorry, much about such devotion is puzzling from an evolutionary standpoint. In particular, why would people undertake the costly displays that so many religions require, which usually detract from individuals' fitness? Among other things, it's going to limit the number of possible mates you might have, right? Or might be able to mate, pers persons you might be able to mate with. Costly displays are one kind of credibility-enhancing display. Now, they range from conspicuous social markers, such as wearing distinctive clothing, observing taboos, and staging and participating in elaborate or dysphoric rituals. Two such things as vows of poverty and chastity, and as we've already seen, handling poisonous snakes, all the way to such extreme acts as martyrdom. Not only do such displays attract attention, since they also carry conspicuous costs, they showcase the religious adherents are not deceptive manipulators. Both formal modeling and empirical research indicate that the creds bias produces stable interlocking systems of costly practices and beliefs that promote group commitment and cooperation. Therefore, the creds bias is favored by cultural group selection. John Landman and Michael Burmester contend that the success of and commitment to religions depend primarily on their adherents' credibility. Controlling for multiple variables, including both the relative priority of religions in participants' upbringing uh, and participants' previous religious practices, Landman and Burmester show that cred's exposure, exposure to credibility-enhancing displays, is a powerful predictor in adults of theistic beliefs, of confidence in those beliefs, and of religious identification. They found that believers' credibility-enhancing displays, rather than their testimonies, are what influence the religious socialization of the young and the conversion of outsiders. In short, these interlocking systems of beliefs and costly practices, that is, creds, encourage commitment to superhuman agents and thereby go some way toward explaining such commitment. Cred's persuasive power helps explain why, and particularly, particularly in large-scale societies where religions compete for followers, successful religions evolve in ways that draw upon the cred's bias. The evolution of the cred's bias also helps explain why religions so often involve costly displays, sometimes even martyrdom. The sociologist of religion, Rodney Stark, has argued that Christianity's early success turned in part on Christians' willingness to care, this will resonate with everyone in the room, to care for the contagious sick rather than to flee from the mostly urban pandemics that repeatedly plagued the ancient Roman world. Similarly, the early church father, Tertullian, 
maintained that the martyr's blood was, quote, the seed, end quote, of, early, of the early church's growth. And the historian of early Christianity, Jan Bremer, holds that the martyrs not only impressed the unbelieving Roman world, but reinforced the steadfastness of their fellow Christians too. Now clearly, I mean, this is the point, right? Clearly, religious thinkers and scholars of religions have long recognized the potent impact of participants' costly sacrifices on other participants and on prospective participants. But cognitive and evolutionary scientists of religions theoretically fertile conceptualization of these dynamics and of the others that I've been discussing that capture salient causal processes and underlying psychological mechanisms that figure in various religions' comparative success. Okay, this must conclude my overview of the byproduct theories and vocations of content biases to explain religious forms, their attractions, and their recurrence, and of the cultural selectionist invocation of context biases to explain religious commitments and costly displays. Now this discussion, I want to stress this, this discussion has been quite limited with regard to the number and variety of such mental dispositions for which theorists have generated empirical evidence and with regard to the number of those dispositions that play some role in shaping religious representations or in commitments to the same. Now before turning to the final part of the talk on religion's cognitive kin, it is worth emphasizing that both the byproduct and the cultural selectionist accounts illustrate what has been a cardinal principle of the cognitive science of religions from its beginnings. Namely, that religions are cognitively natural. They involve nothing extraordinary from a cognitive standpoint. The human mind has no specialized department of religion, nor do religions require any cognitive gymnastics that cannot be found in other cultural arrangements. The relevant content biases are in place because of considerations having nothing to do with religions. The context biases are for the acquisition of adaptive cultural knowledge of any sort. They are in no way tailored for the acquisition of religions. They're generic. They're not domain specific. So that said, let me turn to the final section on religion's cognitive kin. <clears throat> now, if considered from the standpoint of our context biases, Identifying religion's cognitive kin is easy, since virtually all of culture qualifies on the basis of either one or the other of two considerations. The first harkens to the fact that context biases are dispositions to acquire adaptive cultural knowledge. So if some aspects of religions are adaptive, then they almost certainly result indirectly from such context biased learning. And in that regard, they would be akin to elaborate cultural practices in small-scale societies for processing toxic plants, for example, such as manioc, in order to render, render them safe to eat. I mean, to render manioc safe to eat takes about seven days, and it takes about 27 different things. I'm not exaggerating, about 27 different things that you need to do to it. Even when no one in the group knows how such practices work, which is often the case, in cultures that consume manioc as a major nutrient. Such culturally inherited procedures are cultural adaptations that one generation must pass on to the next and that benefit both individuals and the group. The second ground of a context bias driven cognitive susceptibility is the mass media driven rise over the last two centuries of celebrity culture. When people confront stimuli, am I okay? Uh, let's go ahead and put it up there. <laughs> um, I've jumped ahead, sorry. I, I, I lost myself in my own text. Let me go back. The second ground, based on context biases, by virtue of which some cultural phenomena qualify as religion's cognitive kin, 
concerns those biases indirect consequences. So in this respect, they're kind of parallel to the byproduct theory on the content side. Many cultural arrangements, like some developments in religions, arise by virtue of cognitive susceptibilities that context biases create. For example, the conformity bias figures in fads and fashions. However, assuming most fads are not adaptive, these would count as misfires. So, one manifestation of a context-bias-driven cognitive susceptibility is the mass media-driven rise over the last two centuries of celebrity culture. When people confront stimuli that mimic the cues of prestige, a trend which social media have only exacerbated by delivering a steady stream of individuals' images who have become famous because of that ongoing delivery of those images. They're, as they say, famous for being famous. Henrik says, part of figuring out who to learn from is attending to whom others are looking at, listening to, and emulating. People end up attending to whomever the popular media is covering. Attention cues cause people to unconsciously perceive someone as a worthy model. These attention cues can cause our prestige psychology to automatically infer that these individuals are worthy of our imitation, respect, and admiration. This non-conscious inference causes increased emulation and mimicry. Now, Henrik's description underscores many features that mark prestige psychology as maturationally natural. He notes that a few simple social stimuli cue its automatic unconscious inferences. Its mandatory character deserves highlighting, too. When everyone is looking at, listening to, or following some individual, people generally find it impossible not to attend. People cannot resist looking to see what all the fuss is about, because fuss is diagnostic of prestige. This is related to people's inability to ignore screens. The pervasiveness of screens and the business models of the corporations that deliver stimuli to those screens, together with humans' prestige psychology, their content biases for detecting and recognizing agents in their faces, and the ease of the associated automatic inferences, guarantee that celebrity culture isn't going away. These companies literally aim to addict viewers to their platforms. Believe me, they've hired dozens of people who are experts in this in psychology about how to design their screens and their platform. Um, few things will foment such addiction and the endless churning of celebrity culture any better than repeatedly delivering images of people whom users have liked before or new ones that they're likely to find attractive. And believe me, they know the kinds of images that you find attractive. This can lead to confusion about whom people should esteem as cultural models. Recall that cueing prestige bias is about alerting learners to worthwhile models to learn from, to imitate, and be devoted to. Now, when thinking about devoted fans, celebrity culture fits uncomfortably well. Consider Elvis Presley. The preoccupation with imitating Elvis is ongoing 45 years after his death. Here's a photo of fans from just two countries. I couldn't pass this one up. It had a Union Jack. Um, queuing up to visit Graceland. That's Elvis's home, if you don't, have never heard of it which remains second for visitors only to the White House among American homes. Celebrity culture constitutes a persisting illusion of social cognition, induced by cues that automatically trigger our prestige psychology. As with the Mueller-Lyre illusion, remember the lines and the arrowheads, okay? As with the Mueller-Lyre illusion, understanding both that and how celebrity culture is an illusion does not immunize us from its illusory effect. Okay, 
That non-religious cultural forms engage content biases is not news. The resemblances between the gods and the agents that figure in folklore, from brownies, elves, and fairies, to sprites, genies, and gnomes, are obvious. Regardless of what counterintuitive attributes they possess, these beings, like the gods, are mindful agents who accord with our folk psychology. All intuitive deliverances of theory of mind apply, thus we know what they will do in most circumstances. No recent cultural development comes any closer to duplicating the inherent appeal associated with religion's exploitation of content biases than does the stunning worldwide popularity of the superhero movies that now dominate the film industry. Emphasis on the word dominate. Many critical discussions and occasional comments in the movies themselves directly spotlight similarities between superheroes and the gods. Superhero movies take advantage of some of the same content biases that religions do. First, moviegoers audit the superhero's mentality, conduct, and interpersonal relations with the same inferential dexterity that they apply to the gods, to folkloric figures, and to their next door neighbors. Superheroes' counterintuitive properties pose no more problems than do those of the gods. That's because their cognitive kinship runs even deeper. Superhero movies not only take advantage of some of the same content biases that religions do, they take advantage of them in the same way. Superheroes, like the gods, typically manifest at any particular moment, but as, and that is to say, in the context of a narrative, but a single counterintuitive property, and rarely more than two. Mm. So, in one episode, Jesus walks on water. In another, he turns water into wine. And in yet another, he cures a blind man. Similarly, in one episode, Superman flies. In another, he is unfazed by a fusillade of bullets. And in yet another, he sees through walls. Computer-generated imagery in superhero movies has made such counterintuitive properties appear ever more plausible. The critical point, though, is that usually neither Jesus nor Superman manifest even two such properties at once. Superhero movies, like religions, traffic in agents which exhibit minimal or modest counterintuitiveness. MCI is the acronym that has become so well known. Like religious agents, superheroes approximate a cognitive optimum. By typically exhibiting a single counterintuitive feature concerning a standard ontological category, in turn, concerning a content bias, here the category of a person about which we have plentiful content biases. Religious and superhero representations achieve an auspicious balance between grabbing people's attention and sticking in their memories, both of which are necessary for a representation's subsequent transmission while also preserving virtually all the default inferences associated with the category's content biases and the content biases associated with theory of mind. Now, to take that last point first, a representation of a person with a single counterintuitive property grabs attention without overthrowing the plentiful default inferences associated with the category and theory of mind. So, Regardless of the fact that this man walks on water, the inferences that he sees with his eyes, that he needs food and sleep to survive, that he acts to achieve goals, and so on, all still hold and are all still available for free. More than a dozen experimental studies indicate that MCI representations are more easily recalled than both normal, everyday representations, say, I don't know, a representation of a cow that eats grass, and radically counterintuitive representations involving many violations. Uh, a man born of wolves who can disappear at will, uh, walk on water, and hear people's thoughts, <clears throat> which themselves are less well-remembered than even normal representations. Now, such multiple violations of our intuitive understanding will certainly grab people's attention, but such representations are less easy to remember 
and to undermine the ontological category's wealth of intuitively available inferences. Since figuring out which of the standard default inferences continue to prevail when you've got a whole bunch of violations requires just that. You've got to figure them out as opposed to knowing them intuitively. Now, whether superheroes or gods, MCI representations possess noteworthy advantages as cultural items. The crucial point here is that superhero movies have enjoyed stunning success worldwide across cultures. They have been the highest grossing movies in six of the last 14 years, four rank among the top 10 grossing movies of all time, 14 in the top 50, 21 and counting in the top 100. As 40 new Marvel and DC movies alone have been scheduled for release between 2019 and 2029. Sequels in most movie franchises on average see a 10 to 30% decrease in receipts. Superhero movie sequels have consistently attracted increased revenue. Now many Hollywood insiders, however, lament the dominance of superhero movies. The renowned director Martin Scorsese complains that in contrast to cinema, by which he means movie making as an art form, superhero movies are franchise pictures that are market researched until they're ready for consumption. Their ascendancy has created a milieu that is brutal and inhospitable to art. Around the world, the screens are crowded with franchise pictures. We now have two separate fields, and I fear that the financial dominance of one is being used to marginalize the existence of the other. That is to say, the franchise superhero movies are marginalizing what Scorsese calls cinema. Hollywood has found its way to a perennial cultural attractor toward which religions have gravitated for millennia, namely offering up MTI representations of persons. The cognitive theory about the advantages that attach to MCI representations explains both superhero movies' extraordinary success and their irresistibility across cultures. These representations exploit pan-human content biases on which diverse cultural arrangements have scant influence. Now, with regard to both celebrity culture and superhero movies, our new digital technologies, and social media especially, have undoubtedly served as force multipliers. To hold, though, that they should bear the principal explanatory burden for either of these cultural developments overlooks, it seems to me, at least two important considerations. First, <clears throat> Both celebrity and culture and the popularity of superhero representations predate the widespread use of all of these video and digital technologies and the invention of most of them. <clears throat> celebrity culture started in the 19th century with Charles Dickens and Mark Twain. You just need mass media. It doesn't have to be electrified. It's just printing zillions of newspapers. <clears throat> Second, and more fundamentally, that is because, that is to say it predated them, uh, is because both celebrity and culture and the popularity of superhero uh, representations turn finally on cueing the operations of precisely the same psychological mechanisms that religions have evolved to engage for many thousands of years at least. Their cognitive kinship, as well as their persistence, and their cross-cultural appeal all depend upon their culturally constructed cueing of normal cognitive systems that are guaranteed to transfix. That's it. Thank you so much sure. for such a rich and compelling presentation. We have time for one quick question before we make our way through it. Anyone who would like to uh, raise a question, if you could gesture towards me. 
And if you can note that on the panel in front of you, there will be a switch with a button marked speaker so that we can all hear. Professor Macaulay is asked to say more about his theory of superheroes being limited to using a single power at a time. An example is given of the X-Men franchise, which contains many memorable characters who have multiple powers and use them concurrently. No, yeah, I understand the point you were making. I actually expected this question from someone <laughs> who knew these movies well. Um, the, uh, I, I'm not denying that it's the case that there aren't situations that involve multiple violations. Um, I mean, for example, now, I mean, I've got divinity faculty here, and you all may know. I mean, the only one that I can think of in the Bible is when Moses talks to a burning bush. The bush is both burning and not being consumed by fire, and it's talking. So that's two violations. That's the only one I can have ever been able to think of in, in the Judeo-Christian scriptures. In the movies, you're quite right. They get a little more uh, um, uh, loose about this. I'm interested to say that you are here, that you said that those you thought were some of the most compelling moments, because uh, the, one of the predictions of the theory is going to be straightforward, and that is the more that they try to do that kind of stuff, the less appealing these movies are likely to be, because they'll be harder to remember and because people won't know exactly what inferences to draw about sort of in continuing the storylines through 40 more movies, right? Um, but uh, that, there are, that they do occur sometimes, and, and flying is the perfect illustration. I mean, Superman does do sometimes other things besides just fly. That's absolutely right, yes. It's the best I can do for you. <laughs> Thank you, friends, with the advancing R. I'm going to draw the formal part of our proceedings to a close just now, and that leaves me with three things to do. The first is to encourage you to continue the conversation with Professor Macaulay informally at our drinks reception. This is taking place in the Linklater rooms, which is out the main door onto the quad and turn right. Work your way through the passageway and under the arches, you'll find the rooms and soft drinks and wine waiting for you. The second thing is to commend to you our next Gifford Lecture in the Bicentenary Series. This takes place on Tuesday the 8th of November and it's being delivered by Professor Lisa Sedaris from the University of California at Santa Barbara. And her lecture is entitled Unnatural Theology in the Anthropocene. And finally, it remains for me on your behalf to thank our Gifford Lecture for this evening once again for a stimulating presentation and a willingness here and in the wine reception to engage with our questions. Our warm thanks to you.